Welcome to the Twinkle Talks EYFS podcast. Working in the early years is busy, funny, messy and exhausting. Join me, Shana, and the rest of the Twinkle EYFS team as we talk honestly about our experiences as practitioners, teachers and professional nappy changers. Whether you're listening to increase your CPD hours or catching up on our antics whilst driving home from work, Twinkle EYFS will share everything you need to know about all things early years. Hello and welcome back to another episode of Twinkle Talks EYFS. I'm really excited about what we're going to talk about in today's episode because we have got a special guest coming to join me and uh, have a chat today. But before we get into that, it's time for another round of Only in the EYFS where you guys get in contact and um, tell me things that happen in early years that wouldn't really happen anywhere else. Let's have a listen. This week, if only in the EYFS. We've received reports today from Jen Kurtz at the local park who's heard a child running around saying, yay, we are going home for some cock porn and watching it on the big TV. With the mother running behind them yelling, yes, we'll be having popcorn and watching films on the big TV. Thanks for clarifying, Mum. We've received updates from Eliza who's heard a three-year-old girl telling her friendship group that she's just had a really wet fart. The kind of updates we all need. Tell me you work in early years without telling me you work in early years. Rebecca has videoed herself this week brushing her Labrador's teeth for Oral Health Week. That's right Rebecca, you look after that canines canines. That's it for this episode, tune in next time for more antics in only in the EYFS. Thank you, Katie, for those hard-hitting news headlines. I mean, move aside, BBC. This is the kind of news that we need to hear about, okay? Wet farts and um, cleaning dogs' teeth. I mean, what else do you need to know? So, on to our main topic of today's episode. I'm really excited to share with you an interview that took place between me and the amazing Sue Asquith. She is an education consultant and she's come to talk to me today about transition and how we can help as practitioners, but also from a parent's perspective as well. So, without further ado, let's listen to Sue. Okay, so we have got the amazing Sue Asquith with us here today. She is an early years consultant and advisor, and she's here to talk about transition with us. So welcome, Sue. It's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you for asking me. It's a delight to be here with you. Before we get into the nitty gritty of what transition is, tell us about yourself. Tell us about your journey in education and um, your experience in the early years. Okay, so that started back in 1998. Um, I became a registered childminder with my local authority. Primarily because I wanted to spend more time with my then baby, now 26 year old, um, and obviously I helped to bring him up myself rather than um, finding the extra money to obviously put him in childcare and obviously having that mum guilt of not being um, yeah. w- with him as well. And it sent the ideal um, thing for me as a single parent needing to pay my mortgage to earn having with me and carried on from there really. Um, I then did my childcare qualifications or more childcare qualifications, got the training bug started to work with the local authority on their training packages in the local children's centres affiliated with them, rolling out training and helping and mentoring new childminders and parents and things. And then I started working on some DfE funded projects with people like Percy, NDNA, um, ICANN, wow. Communications Trust. And I didn't have the funding myself, obviously worked with other people, but kind of um, doing all that and being on the ECAP project as well, the Every Child is a Talk project, Mm. and tried really to get involved with anything and everything that was happening earlier so that I could obviously build my skills and experience. Then I became a tutor and an assessor and never looked back since really. So it's um, a whole big whirlwind really, I suppose, when you look back, but I've enjoyed every moment of it really. 
Yeah, it's amazing. I love that you have the aspects of all different um, areas of early years. You come in from a parent's perspective, from a educator's perspective, and then a tutor and assessor and developing policies and things like that. It's just, you're very well-rounded, Sue. We are so lucky to have you here. <laughs> uh, so we'll start with the big question. So for our listeners who might not know, we are recording this a couple of days after National Admissions Day, which is, of course, a massive massive time in not only early years children's careers but parents and teachers it's a really big change and so the buzzword the thing that everyone's talking about at the moment is transition which is why we wanted to get you on to share your advice not just to teachers but to parents as well um just to help us through that process so first things first what what does transition actually mean what does it look like so transitions is, if you look up a definition, you'll find something like it's the fluid movement from one thing to another. Obviously, early years transitions can, could mean lots of things. So when we think about transitions in early years, we often think about a baby moving up to toddler room or toddlers moving up to preschool or preschoolers um, getting ready to start school. Yeah. But if we actually think about it, early childhood is full of transitions, babies moving from milk feeds to weaning. Um, moving from a cot to a bed, from nappies to toilet or potty training, mm. um, maybe getting a new sibling on board. There's absolutely loads of transitions to get used to throughout the childhood. And if we are helping children with those smaller age and stage appropriate um, transitions, then we are at a stage where they don't, they're not afraid of change. They might be excited or a little bit like, I'm not really sure, mm. but they've had a positive experience. They've been supported. So that they have got some resilience already thinking, well, last time I felt like this, I tried this or Sue said to try such and such instead and what have you. So mm. when we think about earlier transitions, there are lots of little things that really, really help the big things. Um, so if we can get them in place and obviously work with partnership with pa parents and also reception class teachers, um, we can do a, a, a lot of good in terms of helping children have a positive outlook to transitions. I think that's a really good point you make as well, because if, even me, I, I, I fall into this, that when you when you hear the word transition, you think moving up a year group, moving a room, moving a classroom. But it is, it's actually so much more than that. And especially for young children where they are surrounded by new experiences all the time, they actually have a lot of transitions it's just so we don't see it on that on that same level do we but actually it's really important that we do not just for us to support them but like you say so that the child gets used to the process so to speak of the smaller transitions so that a big when a big transition like changing room changing year group etc comes along it's not such a big shock to the system isn't it Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing that we've all been through a massive change is, of course, the C word COVID. The past two years has it's been really difficult for all of us. And it's in a way its own transition. And I was just wondering what what kind of impact have you seen on children's mental health and well-being during COVID? And ha have you seen that change or have an impact on transitions as well? Yes. And I think for some children, it's, it's a positive thing. And some of them, it's a negative thing, depending on what has happened to them during those two years in terms of COVID. Mm. Maybe also thinking about, obviously, they pick up things from their adults and their environment so maybe starting to think about the adults and how they've supported the children through changing COVID mm. even if you're the most resilient person in the world and you look forward to change and it's not a big deal and you're really you know you're not really phased by that it's the first time that anybody kind of living in in, in this day and age really has, has obviously come across a pandemic and right. it's the fear of the unknown really isn't it and some people I always go back to those first few days, struck weeks when everybody went out bulk buying toilet rolls and um, rice and, mm. and pasta and anything that they could fill the cupboards with that obviously didn't go out of date particularly. Obviously stockpiling, not really <sighs> knowing what to expect. Yeah. And those are all the people possibly in fight and flight mode. Yeah. Nothing to draw upon, don't know what I'm doing. I'm just going to go out and buy anything that will last me and, and obviously we'll try and dig in for this and, and see, what, see what happens. Some of those parents and adults have lived through COVID and survived it. Some of them have been thriving through it. So that will obviously depend on the um, feelings and the experiences that the children are getting, whether the children have stopped maybe at childcare because that adult's a key worker or whether maybe they spent time at home with their adults. Mm. Children, are, we're finding possibly quite a lot of feedback from nurseries and childminders in preschools now 
are that children struggle with some transitions because they're not used to, they're not as socialised as maybe they were. Mm. So they've missed lots of toddler groups and birthdays and going to play gyms and things like that, which means then that they're not ready or they're not, they haven't got the experience of larger groups, lots of noise, different environments, yeah. which all add to the confusion, I suppose, of these children that are ready to go to school because it's a it's an unknown thing again and I think it probably just depends really on whether it's a positive or negative experience through COVID and the things they can draw upon at this time. Yeah absolutely and I think as you as you're saying that I was trying to picture when I was um, a teacher in nursery during COVID and I remember that first September in 2020 thinking oh my goodness this is going to be the toughest year ever these poor children Mm-hmm. they're they for the majority of their life they have not left the house and they have missed so so much um no one's going to want to come to nursery they're going to be screaming it's going to be the worst half term ever and surprisingly it was the easiest it was the calmest um september transition i have had ever and i think it really shocked me because i was expecting all of this i was literally i was preparing like this okay these children aren't going to have this so we're going to provide more of this and mm-hmm. and all of this stuff but actually you're right for some children it would have actually really benefited them um because i mean there are countries in europe that do it don't they they start school a lot later they have more time at home their early years is spent at home mm-hmm. um and they say it's because of a lot of educational benefits and things like that um i feel like you know in the uk we do start our our children in formal education quite young compared to the rest of europe and actually for a lot of them it really suited them it gave them more time Mm -hmm. to really kind of understand their own environment come into their own you know kind of that egocentric child kind of thing about understanding who they are where their place is and then they were so grounded in that that they felt that they were confident enough to go into an outside space so it really I think you're so right it really does depend on a the individual child the individual experience of um, the parents as well and yeah they're in their experience of COVID because it I mean yes of course a lot of families really did struggle absolutely mm. um, a lot of us did but there were some children that actually that extra time at home that extra family time because parents had to work from home or absolutely. unfortunately you know they might have been furloughed or things like that really horrid things that did happen mm-hmm. um, for some for some children it did mean that they were able to have more family time and that that obviously benefited them Absolutely, yeah, yeah. And I think from going into different nurseries, lots of people are saying about the PSED, they can see the difference and they can Mm. also see the difference with communication and language. But then there are some nurseries that are saying, we don't really see a difference at all now. Um, Mm. The children, we're thinking they've caught up or they're keeping up and and they're not really noticing a difference. But I think if you ask the general question about children, uh, they usually say personal, social, emotional development, making relationships maybe playing with other children because Mm. they might have obviously had some really nice experiences maybe during lockdown but they've missed out on that kind of parallel play and that kind of um cooperation play and obviously then that's going to knock onto the creativity so I always say and I've said for years regardless of COVID we need to see the individual child meet them where they're at and then obviously we go from there Mm. if there are any gaps there any delays there fair enough but let's meet them there where instead of where chronologically they should be absolutely and then we can obviously work our magic and, and really help the individual children in unique ways yeah absolutely because I think that's kind of the whole ethos of early years isn't it it's that every child is unique and and sometimes uh, we might not slip away from that but the the pressures of data and an assessment it just kind of strips all of that away and this notion of school readiness like what what does that really mean I think I'm going to do another episode on this actually but you know Mm -hmm. we've got this onus on right how can we help the children prepare how can we help the parents prepare which of course is important but actually what are the schools doing to meet the child where they're at Mm -hmm. and that's I think that's really really important 
and something that transition is so useful for her isn't it it's not just beneficial for the children and the families but it actually is great for us as educators to be like right this is where this cohort is this year this particular child can do this this particular child struggles with that so I'm going to change up my environment I'm going to change up my teaching style to suit these children Mm -hmm. and I think that's really really important and I think sometimes we forget and I keep thinking I'm going to really look into this I started to look into it at uni years ago but I only had maybe like maybe just a half a week or something thing to start looking at it and then I think my library passed from out and I couldn't get to it oh, no. but you know when you can get all that rich journal stuff and in, in, yes. in uni, you can really get loads and loads of reading I started looking into summer loss and um, I've tried googling it and, and looking in, in various search engines for things and I can't find as much anymore but I kind of had everything open and I was really looking forward to getting my teeth into a new piece of research yeah. and then I couldn't follow it up but they were saying that if children leave childminders nurseries preschools at the end of July and they have that summer off we're saying, oh, yeah, children can do this and they're confident with doing that and they're independent in doing the other, but then maybe they lose some of that. I know Offset was saying when they came back after lockdown, there was a lot of regression and, and we know that through research that happens also during the summer holidays. Yes. And then also just because they were confident with their key person in their uh, preschool or nursery or childbinder and that environment doesn't mean to say they're going to be super confident on day one or week one or month one mm. in terms of that new environment in reception as well so yeah. I think we do these transition reports and we try our best to get that information over but absolutely it's every teacher wondering what's that unique child all about obviously reading and having discussions with parents and, and key people but then taking that child just as a you know an, an open book maybe on day one because they might have regressed or they might not yet feel comfortable to be doing the things that they used to do before so yeah that's so important yeah you're so right and from kind of like your experience in going into nurseries and things um what kind of what kind of things have you seen impacting children during transition what are the big kind of things that you spot the uncertainty and the anxiety to begin with I think mm. but I think it's really important to remember that children haven't got that first-hand experience we know what starting school is about we know what big school is all about and who the Mm. teachers might be and things like that but it's an absolute foreign concept totally for the children Mm. we might as well be saying we've got a rocket ship and we're going to Mars tomorrow because they've absolutely Mm. no idea what that means either Um, and when I was a childminder I think the children were very lucky in terms of the from babies toddlers preschoolers they always did the school runs and it was they wanted to be that big boy and all girl with their book back and uniform and they absolutely couldn't wait to get through that gate on that first day into the earliest unit and wanting to go through but a lot of children obviously hadn't had that experience and then the playground's a big and frightening place mm. and obviously there are lots of big boys and girls bustling about and big lines and whistles blowing to line up and things and it it can be a, a frightening frightening place if they've not got used to it mm. so I think we forget sometimes that the children don't have those first-hand experiences if they haven't got the siblings at school maybe and Things like just reading the books about what it's like to go to school, yes. making your own books even better. Can you get the school teachers to give you photographs and make books? And some of the teachers are getting back into this year, going back into the nurseries maybe to read stories with the children and getting to know mm. them, which is fantastic. But maybe if they can take a video of their classroom and the outdoor areas and we're really giving children a first hand in this is what school's all about. Yeah, and we know what it's like. We know we've been through it every year. It's, you know, oh, and, and the thing is, I think as well, we always say to younger children, oh, big school, big school, as if we assume that they know what that means. And the, probably the poor child is like, yeah, big school. What yeah. What is that? What does that actually look like? <laughs> yeah. yeah, we often say, don't we, you're going to big school and they look at you going, Maybe people are saying that word a lot, but I don't really know what that is. Right, exactly. And I know you touched on a couple of the things, but what kind of what guidance would you give to supporting children with that particular transition, that that move into a new setting? I think we can do lots. I mean, obviously it depends because nurseries are sometimes stuck with the thing that actually children are going to six or seven different schools, but Mm. it obviously depends on what's happening for you in your area and how many children are going to various schools. But Mm. as you said, we had the admissions um, emails probably um, yesterday or the day before, um, 19th of April, I think they were, weren't they? And Mm. we were thinking then um, about maybe you could the parents can tell the nursery manager or or the key person who where they're going which school they're going to Mm. and then maybe we can start with um maybe little cohorts of children that are going to this school that school the other school 
if there's more than one child, obviously that wouldn't work if there was just one child going somewhere else. But um, if, if one group is, is going to the school with the blue uniform and one's going to the green uniform, maybe then we can start to get bits of uniform, maybe some um, hand-me-down bits of uniform. Maybe we can take photographs off school. Maybe if we can maybe take children on a walk past school so that they can actually you know experience those kind of things. Mm. It's trying to give them those kind of first-hand experiences to bolt some knowledge onto, really. Yeah. And then sometimes the schools have got lovely videos and, and, and meet the teacher kind of things on their website so you can get to that free. Or we can maybe speak to the reception class teachers and staff saying, can we have some photographs so we can make a book about starting school? And the child could maybe then take photographs of nursery and their key person and their mums and dads and families and things. And then there's a focal point if, if for that shy child on that first day, they, they can take that transition book. This is you, but this is me. Um, it's difficult because the teacher can't read 30 of those. But, you know, no. if we can try and get involved with doing things like that, I think little things make big things, don't they? They just make it a lot easier sometimes. Yes. I love that idea because, I I mean, I've done this. I I make... um you know, the transition packs for the, the children and the families, like these are your teachers, this is their name and their photos, this is the garden, these are these areas. But actually doing it for the child and being like, you know, this is my nursery, this is where I am my now, this is my key worker, I think is such a lovely take on it. Because like you say, when they come, the unfamiliarity is going to completely throw them. So if they have something that is familiar, that they feel like they can share I think that's, that's that's a really, really lovely piece of advice. That's that's great. And in terms of parents, because uh, I know there'll be a lot of parents that will be listening, do you have any advice for them, supporting them perhaps maybe in the summer to get them ready for that big change? Yeah, I think um, from parents' point of view, it's thinking, do I have to adjust my routines at home? So bedtime routine, for example. If they've mm. only gone to nursery for the afternoon session, for example, obviously they're going to have to be up and ready. Yes. So maybe adjusting the routines at the start of the summer holidays, if not sooner. Maybe bedtimes need adjusting so they can get, a, obviously, a full night's sleep. And then there's time, and it's not a rush and chaos on a morning to try and get the breakfast down them and get the uniform on and rush off to school. Mm. Maybe then they could to talk to the child about how they're going to go to school obviously some parents will go in the car if you're going to walk or maybe walk halfway or what have you maybe do that practice run a few times so the children get to to, to um experience that the parents it will help parents with timing because obviously the school run in school run nine o'clock mayhem takes longer than normal mm -hmm. um <laughs> Maybe things like uniform and um, getting the children to practice putting the uniform on because we know as a, as a reception class teacher and a reception class staff, one of the biggest nightmares mm. is PE, isn't it? Oh, it is. And all those unnamed shirts and things Ugh. that are fly about and everything getting backwards and, you know, yep. it's just one of those things, isn't it? I'm literally getting sweaty as you're saying these. This is yeah, like bringing back can, memories. Yeah, you can <laughs> um, Obviously, labelling your child's uniform, huge. Even if it's only a biro or a Sharpie or something and writing your child's initials or names and everything. There's loads of things. I When my 26-year-old was little, I had the thing of buying those... Um, they were all embroidered and I had to sit and sew them in and yes. it took hours. But there's so many things now. With my other child, I got them some, I think they were called stickings. And yes. they're absolutely the best thing because you think that these labels are going to fall off and absolutely they were brilliant and they washed and washed and washed. Yeah. In fact, years later, we'd pass the jumper on to somebody um, in the childminding world. And years later, it went lost property and it came back to <gasps> us. And I'm going, oh, no, 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 that song falls now. But this, <laughs> this label wouldn't come out. That's brilliant. Um, but just making sure that you know, obviously all your kit is and, and coats and gloves and everything else is, you know. Right. I was yeah. going to say coats is something that everybody misses. And I'm like, no, because there are about three or four coats that are exactly the same size and the same pattern. You've all gone to the same shop and bought it during the back to school sales, which is great. Mm -hmm. But now we don't know <laughs> whose jacket is whose. Coats and also, and shoes. Shoes. we're just on the same page. Shoes! <laughs> and also putting left and right in the bottom of the shoes, I think is really helpful. Just an L and an R or a little arrows face it. Cause I think that also really mm. helps children to put their shoes on independently as well, not just have their name in. So top tip for shoes. If your child has got, if they're like, let's say trains or something like that, if you've got a, a label, that's quite a large label, if you cut it in half and you put half the train in and half the train <gasps> in into the shoe, and then when they put them together, they can see it goes together. Oh, actually, no, that's the wrong way around. That was a really um, good one for our um, 
our children to get um, their shoes on the right feet. So, and that worked, it's really simple idea. That's a genius yeah. idea. Yeah, that's so simple. And it's great because the kids can have their own little sticker. Oh my gosh, that's great. Much more interesting than left and right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, what about our children that maybe are multilingual and um, perhaps they've come from a different country um, and so their families speak a different language other than English? Or what about our families that have uh, perhaps children with um, additional education needs. Um, so their transition is obviously going to look a little bit different. Mm -hmm. um, what kind of what kind of things can we do to support those families and those children? I think it's working with the schools with this because obviously some children and some families will need extended transitions. It could be argued that the cohort of children last year, this year and maybe even next year might need a little bit more than that transition day. Mm, and I do get it. Yeah. Teachers have got the things to do from day one. They've got the baseline assessments to do. They've got head teacher pressure mm. maybe on them to get this done and that done. But maybe yeah. really thinking about for these children that might need more than that hour transition visit or, or something. Um, children we send maybe will need some more time to get used to the um the smells and the sensory side of things mm. going on transition day is completely different to going on the day when everybody's there when the rest of the school's yes. there when the smells coming from the kitchen and all sorts of things and yeah. those things are little things maybe to most people but big things to some children and um, in terms of additional languages i think it's similar to what we try and do when we are settling children and parents into childcare mm. but trying to make sure that anything the schools are giving out on parents new parents evenings and things trying to think is there any way we can ask the school to see if they can get those translated the school are schools aware that this particular family have got English as additional language and some of the things that they can do some of the local authorities are really good at being able to provide translation information or maybe an interpreter if necessary. Um, maybe somebody within the school in terms of the parents that are already there could do a bit yes. of translating and give them some first-hand experience about what was tricky for them. Mm. Knowing that people who have come from different countries will be maybe well versed in what school's like in that different country. But as we've already said, obviously children start school quite early in England compared to everywhere else um, and some of the systems might be different as well so yeah just trying to understand the cultural being culturally aware and understand the potential barriers and putting as much in place to mitigate those as possible I guess yeah no that's really good I remember when I was trying to get ready for um, you know like presentation evenings and um, home visits and things like that I didn't realise, I, it was only till someone who was new into the school came and told me that our local council had a service where if you were a school, you could request an interpreter. So you just ring up this number and say, look, I've got this family that's from this country. Do you have someone that speaks this language who can either come on a Zoom call with us and translate as we go or can actually physically come to the meeting? Um, because it's really important. And I know, no, even for um, families who do speak English, those admission packs are very overwhelming there is a lot of documentation mm -hmm. if english is not your first language it's just a whole other ball game so if you're listening and you do work in a school ask your head teacher but also go into your local authority because i'm sure that there will be an interpreter service of some sort and they can also go through documents and and translate as well which is amazing so really useful tool yeah, and I guess from an early years practitioner's point of view or, or manager's um, point of view, the parents will have got established trust in relationships, hopefully, in terms mm. of their earlier setting. So they could bring some of that maybe to, to the earlier setting and just go, can you help with this form? Yes. Because they won't feel as apprehensive about going back to where they feel as though they've got a sense of belonging and they've got those relationships already set up. Mm. Um, and if there's any, e I sometimes call it EYFS lingo or EYFSness that they don't understand understand yeah I mean they will have heard of the some of the PSEDs and what have you probably from their um early years people mm. but if there's anything any lingo there that they don't understand then obviously um that maybe the key person of the child can maybe help them fill some of that information out as well yeah really good idea yeah really good um I've kind of already touched on this again but in terms of not just reception practitioners preparing for their new cohort, but like you say, as current key workers, as current uh, nursery or preschool practitioners, what can we do to support those children and those families that will be moving up that make that transition? 
I think this summer term is the the biggest thing, isn't it? Now, we've, obviously, we, we maybe know where the children are going. And mm. um, thinking about that, we talked about school readiness earlier, or you said maybe we do need to do another um, session on school readiness. But I did put a poll out in one of the Facebook groups um, about a month ago because I was writing a course about transitions, mm. and. I asked the teachers, can you please um, do a poll? I, I did a poll and I, I maybe put five or six different things there, but then add your own at the bottom. Mm. What are your top five school ready skills? And I can't remember which way around it was now, but one reading your own, um, recognizing your own name in print or maybe writing your own name and phonics. So they were the six people had voted for something and one person had voted for the other. But something like 500 and odd teachers are saying, being able to separate from their parents and carers, yes. being able to find their own belongings and manage them appropriately, being able to play alongside other children, yeah. being able to listen to a story and tell an adult if, if something's wrong or something hurts or they're not feeling well. Mm. Those were the top, overwhelmingly the top ones. So making sure that obviously children can do that, spotting them with the self-regulation and that emotional literacy for them to be able to talk to teachers. Mm. Um, maybe putting on the transition forms about how that child does communicate if they're feeling anxious and cross. Yes. Sometimes it's not the words that come out, is it? Sometimes it's the actual... Um, that you can see a child, you can see an adult cat, you can see the face in the recognition of the face and, and what's that, what's going on there as well. Yeah. So um, just trying to get to know that child. And then things like independent schools, carrying trays, being able to put the uniforms on, things like that, um, hugely important, I think, in this final term. Mm. But I think a lot of people also start to think about transitions just in a summer term. But actually, if we think about independence and, and everything from babies and toddlers onwards, we're doing those tiny steps all the time into being that as school ready as possible in, in, in air quotes. Yes. To think about, um, you know, building those schools. So we've got confident, cumulative um, children, confident, hopefully start school yeah. um, and, and do well. And I think it is a really common misconception, isn't it? Like that the most important thing that teachers want to see is all oh, my, you know, a, a lot of um, parents that will come into nursery when I'll do a home visit or things like that, I'll say, okay, so tell me about your child. And they'll immediately say they can read their own name. They can, they know their, the letters of the alphabet. They can count up to 20. And yes, that is, that that's great. That's amazing. But actually the prime areas are prime areas for a reason. We've got the communication and language, the physical development, the motor development, the personal, social and emotional development. These are the things that are not just important for teachers, but it's important for the children, isn't it? And I think it's a very common misconception. Mm -hmm. And actually, I feel like we've all, especially in terms of um, the education system, we've, we've really made a shift onto actually the holistic child and actually their neurological and physical development mm -hmm. first before we even go into academics so I think we it would be nice um for practitioners to really dispel that myth for parents and put them at ease and be like don't worry if they can't spell the alphabet it's it's really not a problem mm -hmm. <laughs> there are other things that um should be worked on uh, before that yeah, and sometimes really, if the parents have been showing them their ABCs or what have you, and we're actually been doing ABCs in capitals and things like that, that's obviously contrary to what they're going to be learning in school. And that yes. sometimes is worse because then the teacher's got to start again with the purest sounds and the lowercase. Absolutely. And obviously parents do it with all the best guidance in the world, thinking that's going to make the child smarter and it's good. But then if you've got to relearn, it's more difficult for the child, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, that's a really good point. So, um, yeah, yeah. lots of of um, little things that we could maybe dispel along the way and, and really help parents to focus on the getting dressed um, being ready having your routines being confident yeah, um kind of thing and and parents as well um we've I don't think we've spoken about it yet but that kind of the child being confident to leave their parent if parents had a negative experience of school themselves and they're not thrilled about the child starting school mm. and their anxieties are passing on to the child then maybe that's a whole host of mm. other things isn't it so maybe we need to speak to parents about anything that they might be worried about any information that they might need because again the, the whole host of um how the children's going to react will be very similar in terms of you know what information and what vibes they're getting from their parents as well 
Absolutely. And I think it's always really easy to to miss the parents in this, isn't it? It's our focus is on the child and making sure their transition is okay. But actually, what about the parents? For some of them, this might be their first child going into this. Mm -hmm. Like you say, there might be other families that have come from a different country and it's a completely new education system and they have no idea what's happening. And they're going to they're going to need support through their own transition in that as well. So, yeah, I think that's a really good point Mm -hmm. with all of this. My question now is for teachers, especially for the reception teachers. Okay. It's a lot. This time of year, I know I always remember coming back from Easter holidays. I'm like, right, the work begins. The work really you know, gets into gear now. I've got my class right here that I'm going to prepare this whole summer term. We're going to get ready for year one. But then also, hang on a minute, my current cohort, I've just got the list. I've just got the list of my new cohort. I've got 60 kids in my head. I'm not really sure where to go. How how do we, as, as educators, balance supporting our current children already, but also preparing for that next cohort? I know. You need to clone yourself is all I'm saying. I don't know. It's really <laughs> yeah, tricky, yeah. isn't it? <laughs> really tricky i don't think i have any one size fits all solutions to that it's really no. really tricky um obviously um it you've yeah you've got to do both haven't you and it's really difficult to have mm. 60 people in mind especially when you might not have met those new people yet those new little children coming through as well yeah. and then depending on your local authority sometimes the funding agreements mean that all early years providers that are with funded children have to do transitions and then if you think about all these files that you might be getting from various <sighs> places yeah and one nursery might do it differently to another and the preschool might do it differently and then the child minds might do it differently definitely again um it's a huge minefield and I know from the past experience that teachers haven't necessarily had the time to Mm. read properly what we've said about the children Mm. and then with the children that are struggling with their regulation and their behavior or to manage their own behavior and they they are a little bit anxious or or frustrated about the world and they come out ashen after a couple of weeks when that child's you know just kind of showing the true colors Mm -hmm. and then you think well if you'd have just read what 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 was there to begin Mm -hmm. with I would have given you a whole host of information but maybe they don't have time to and I absolutely realize that and it's really tricky to do that yeah but trying to find out as much as possible about those new starters um so you can meet them from um where they're coming from on on day one um yeah but how you do that when you've also obviously you've got your own children that one transition day it would be wonderful if you had a harry potter or a hermione grin just stop the clock thing wouldn't it so that you could oh yeah the little time turner yeah so the children could spend more time wherever they go and you've got more time to spend with the children that are coming up <laughs> but it's not going to work is it and i do understand no. i mean it's 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 easy for me to say the teachers need to do this and this but obviously the teachers have got loads of things to do and like you say you've yeah. got to split yourself in half almost and, and try to help um the children transition into year one and obviously do your own reports with your internal reports with your um, key search one teachers yeah and yes profiles and and then the profiling yeah. yeah and then obviously start to think about the transitions and visiting the schools that are, are visiting the nurseries and doing your story times and trying to get as much possible um you know those relationships started with those children as well yeah i don't know I, it is the answer to that one it's a huge thing isn't it it's really difficult it's massive isn't it yeah but i think as well it's just just through um listening and talking it's it's also that you know it's it's a massive transition for us and all of this stuff that we're preaching to our children to our to our parents to our colleagues actually we should understand that it's a transition for us as well what do we need Mm -hmm. to ensure that this transition is actually working for us as well and community makes such a big difference I think if you have those relationships with the preschools that are in your area so you know that you know you're more than likely to get children from from those preschools child minders that um I've had throughout the years um I look they'll always come back because they'll be child minding a new set of children um in that age group and it's it's really about I suppose just reaching out and 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 like you say making those connections and not relying on but also using those reports from the nurseries from the child minders from the preschools like it is there to help us and um, mm-hmm. sometimes like you say we're not always going to get the time to to read them all which is a real shame but. Mm -hmm. then you've got the home visits the parents know their children inside out and it's just yeah just being like for that first half term 
it's okay. I feel like there's a lot of pressure in that first half term, isn't it, to really get cracking. But actually, I, mm-hmm. from personal experience, I feel the more relaxed, the more free that first half term is, the more it's more, okay, let's just see how the children react to this space first before we're like, right, we're going to learn about space, right, we're going to, I feel like you're getting on the maybe the the back foot by doing yeah. that but there is a lot of pressure from top down from schools yeah. isn't there yeah from top down definitely and right you need to have a curriculum you need to have a plan you need to have evidence of this etc yeah. but actually settling in takes i would say at least one half term for all Absolutely. children in a school setting yeah, yeah. Um, so maybe it's having those conversations with SLT as well and saying like, look, this, you know, this is early years. It's very different mm-hmm. from going into year two, going from year three to year four. It's, it's, it's not, it's not the same. And this is what we need. And maybe just having that open conversation as well. Yeah. It is tricky though, when you read the guidance from the phonics programs and the early writing mm. programs, cause it's like, you know, from the day one, um, morning one, the first sound gets rolled out and, and yeah. actually you do, like you say, and it's just that let's take a breath of fresh air, everybody, the DFE, everybody, um, SLT, mm-hmm. Um, head teachers this is what we need to do with these children in the first six weeks now, now more than ever maybe um but it could be argued that obviously forever in the past has also been a, a thing as well it's really important to get the psed right and if that is right then obviously we'll grow it's the foundation it's like the roots of the flower isn't it if we want the children yeah. to flower by the end of the early learning goals and by the end of reception then we need to concentrate on the seed watering it making sure the roots are there etc absolutely but yeah, I mean, these baseline assessments and things they've got to do as well. And obviously, you know, there's just pressure, isn't it? Pressure, pressure, pressure. It is a lot of pressure. Yeah. But hopefully a couple of those things will help each other, which would be quite yeah. nice. But we've actually got a couple of questions um, from listeners. Um, so we did a little reach out on social media um, a couple of weeks ago to say hey we've got this amazing person called sue coming talking all about transition what do you want to know and we've got a couple of questions for you okay so th- i think this is coming from a reception teacher's perspective we've got a lady called laura she says what kind of key information should we as reception teachers share with year one teachers okay so that's obviously transition into year one so i would be saying um it's important to obviously share your EYFSP Mm. or some data from it who are um, achieving who are not achieving what are the targets of for each child Mm. what are each child's learning styles like Mm. so um with my youngest child for example if you were friendly we, we, we know teachers are their children's friends, but if they are friendly and you acknowledged how helpful he wanted to be and, and his little personality, he would do anything for you and he would learn and grow and he would do, you know, he really takes on board. If you had a negative experience early on, like you forgot his name even, just something really simple, um, it would, you know, his, his heart would be on the floor. And if, if his heart mm. wasn't happy, then the child wasn't happy. And I think that's, it's it's obviously that, that way mm. for a lot of children. So just imparting as much, as possible in terms of their interests their likes their strengths yeah how to make those relationships or how they feel that that child has made the relationship with them sometimes in you one well i suppose sometimes in reception there are job shares maybe so obviously making sure that you're on the same page there year one teachers from my past there was a job share and one of them would say go put your work in the finished tray and then one of them calls it a finished box uh, but the one didn't wouldn't change to box because it wasn't a box it was tray. <laughs> the other ones always said box so she wasn't and it was like it was confusing for the children yeah so obviously that consistency um mm. where there are job shares as well but yeah, yeah i think interests and personalities and those characteristics and how they learn is is a really um, useful thing and if if you one is less play based which usually is the case I mean I know sometimes they do try and play out with the early years unit or, or have some of those kind of links in with the early years unit but if year one is um, more of a formal thing then obviously maybe need to think about children's sensory awareness and mm. and are they physically ready to sit and hold a pen and sit at right. a desk all day or, or m- most of the day and what have you yeah. and, and really try and work on some of those skills as well maybe yeah that's really good I think this one is from a parent so she's called Ellen and she says 
my child didn't get their first choice of school so what do we do now I'm sure a lot of parents may be asking this question yeah really tricky obviously schools have only got a certain amount of places and sometimes mm. if you have got an older child that goes there and obviously you need to be in the catchment and then and then those are the kind of criteria span out from there really yeah but if you haven't got your first choice of school then you can appeal but obviously you may not win your appeal. Mm -hmm. I, I helped a child or a parent win their appeal when I was a childminder because they lived in a different town to, to I did. So I live in a village, they lived in the nearest town and they wanted to go to the village school and they didn't get in because of their child's home postcode. But when we looked at the fact that she'd spent from three months to four and a half years, she spent all the time in my village or most of it, 40 odd hours a week, making friends, going to toddler groups with those that there's that cohort of children and what have you. And there was a massive um, spiel that I could obviously back up the um, appeal with. So if you're going to appeal, you need to th not just think from the heart, but think from the head. Mm. Yes, you're, you're heartbroken that you've not got that school, but actually can you back it up the reasons why you think it would be helpful for that um, child to go there? Difficult, because like I say, everybody might appeal and, and then obviously they've only, they might have a space or two spaces or no spaces. So what are they going to do about that? And Lucy kind of says the similar thing. She um, actually tells us about one of her experiences, actually. She says, it was a long time ago now, but we had a nightmare, or at least it felt like one at the time, with our oldest when she didn't get any of our selected choices for primary. As a parent, the questions that I mainly wanted to ask at the time were, is the decision final? What should I do next? Who, who do I even contact for advice? What, you know, what, what are my options? How do I apply for an appeal? You know, what is the process like? There's, there's so many different things that I feel like maybe parents don't get knowledge to. And she says here, she understands that different councils would, you know, potentially have varying criteria. But, you know, are there places that she can go to to ask these sorts of questions i don't think there's a one size fits all question to that or answer to that one but um you obviously can go to the admissions um telephone number helpline or what have you that that information's come from um do they have any extra pieces of information parents sometimes don't understand or don't realize that they don't have to go to school into reception class straight away they can decelerate de or or um, defer their child's start. So maybe if they wanted to, for their child to spend their reception year with their child mind during their preschool in their nursery, that is an option if they want to do. Mm. Um, and they can start in year one. Or for the younger summer born children, you can actually just spend a year sometimes in, in nursery preschool or with your child mind and start in reception the next year. Yeah. And then there's the option sometimes of homeschooling as well. Um, sometimes there are maybe um, a private school you could look into that because sometimes the fees are extortionate but sometimes they're not and sometimes you can get a scholarship and sometimes there's funding available for children to go to different schools as well mm. so I'm not aware in, in our area of a kind of ring so and so and they help you um, but just being more informed and maybe reading more about what is, is, is um, available in your local authority at the end of the day, you can or anybody can request for a deceleration or a um, or a deferral of, of school, but it's down to the local authority whether they'll let you skip that year and go into year one, or whether you can spend you can spend time in the earlier setting and going to reception the next year. Oh, interesting. So it's up to them to make that decision, but it, it, anybody can and ask for that. So mm. and that might be helpful, maybe from some of the children from the parents. They're coming from different countries where mm. they think that obviously maybe in their country the children might not start six, till six or seven in school so maybe that might suit actually some parents yeah as well. that's really good I think I've heard as well that there are some early years and nursery settings that offer a reception year as well which is actually yeah. quite exciting so yeah maybe um like you say be informed ask don't be afraid to ask I think mm -hmm. is the main thing isn't it go and go and have a look for yourself look at what your your rights are what you can do and speak to the schools and yeah. and like you say the authorities as well they'll they'll have information which is great I think it's really exciting in some of the international schools that I've been working with that they do maybe um start the they might not have the tiny babies maybe in the international schools but from toddlers through mm. but then they keep the um the reception and sometimes even year one in the same 
um, international schools start kindergarten and then they go off into yeah. the um, into the more formal schools. And again, the, the progress that they make because it's a play based approach all the way through reception seamless into year one mm. is, is again, it's a huge, huge thing. So even where they're going into national schools to quite a what I'd probably call a chalk and talk kind of resume when they go into big school because they've spent more time in that play based approach, the more resilient, the better problem solvers, they're, they're more able to go into that more formal way of, of working as well. So that's really interesting, and exciting, and maybe something we should look into in the UK as well, maybe. Oh, yeah, I know. Drop hints there. <laughs> we'll, uh, get in touch with uh, Bojo right now. <laughs> Um, it's been so it's just been so good talking to you I could honestly talk to you all day we're going to end with kind of like a little fun quiz that I kind of do with all my guests a little uh, token that we do it's um, a would you rather teacher edition okay Okay, so we've got some hard hitting questions here Sue I hope you're ready for this all right absolutely Would you rather tea or coffee? Coffee. Oh. However, if it's really, really awful cheap coffee and you don't have some proper milk, <laughs> I'd rather go. I'd rather go herbal tea. I don't drink tea as in the traditional tea with milk, and, and I, I don't like traditional tea. But if you've got a flavoured, I don't know, a raspberry or a, a strawberry or mm. something, um, I would probably go that over cheap coffee and horrible long life milk because that's really like no it's not not nice is it um but usually coffee coffee i'm a bit of a coffee caffeine freak so usually coffee only the good stuff (laughs) and we kind of need it in early years don't we keeps us going we do (laughs) question number two would you rather run out of whiteboard pens or highlighters with my early years hat on, I'd say highlighters because I do like a good um, whiteboard marker. However, if as a student, I'd definitely say I'd rather run out of whiteboard markers. So it depends which hat I've got on, I think, because I do like both. Yeah. If you'd have asked me about flip charts and whiteboards, I might have said flip chart was the one I'd rather run out of because you can do both with the whiteboard markers, can't you? But um, <gasps> oh, That's a good point. See, I love a good flip chart. I don't know why. I prefer a flip chart to a whiteboard. So it's interesting that you say, I'm going to add that on to one of my questions for another guest. We're going to put it to other people. Is it going to be whiteboards or flip charts? That's yeah. a good one. Because flip chart, if you if you try and write, write on a whiteboard, which I'm sure you've already tried to do, because most of us has, with the wrong one, doesn't come off, does it? Yeah. Oh, I've got a trick for that. Go over it. So okay. if you, yeah, you yeah, go yeah. over it and then it comes off with a white. I was like, oh my God, I've, I've I've missed this trick my entire career. I found it all like on the last year I was teaching. I was like, I should have used this for nine years. Yeah, yeah. But you can't do it the other way around. So I think that's probably a top tip, isn't it? Oh, that is a very good top tip mm-hmm. and very important for that decision. I'll keep that in mind. <laughs> and question number three, final one. Okay. Would you rather do a whole school assembly or run a whole school staff meeting? Hmm. <laughs> Interesting. I don't think I'd mind, to be honest. I'd probably go with the assembly because obviously the children will be at the assembly and I'm usually quite good at speaking with the children. Yeah. Um, but depending on the topic, maybe, of the um, the whole staff, um, I could maybe um, give them all lots of things about safeguarding or um, communication with children or how to, in an air quotes, manage children's behaviour in terms of their self-regulation skills and things. So it would depend. But I think just as holistic, one jump one way I'd probably go with the assembly yeah I think I would as well kids are great and they're such a good audience because you know you can crack a joke and be silly and it's, it's the best assembly ever you try and do that in a staff meeting <laughs> oh, <it's laughs> well, it? yeah it doesn't get the same response <laughs> funnily enough I don't know why <laughs> Um, it's just it's been great to have you on the show thank you so much for coming I just kind of wanted to end with a little word from you it just kind of just summarize everything that we've talked about today what is the one thing that you would love our listeners to take away with from today I think partnership working and seeing the transitions from all angles from the early years practitioners angles of saying goodbye to those children and obviously the children saying goodbye and and, and moving Mm. on parents and teachers and working in holistic partnership and trying to do the best like you say it's it's it's, we can't so we can't be all to everybody but just trying to see the barriers and and the anxieties maybe from everybody's angles and be more informed so we can do as much as possible working in partnership with everybody 
Amazing. Thank you so much, Sue. If people want to contact you and find out more, where can we find you? Facebook is probably the easiest. I've got a Facebook group um, that people can join. It's just under my name, so Sue Asquith, Early Childhood Consultant. Um, I've got a website under the same name, so you can find me there. I am on LinkedIn and Twitter, but I don't do a great deal on those things. But you can obviously message me through those um, th those, those portals, if you like, and um, you will find me on there as well. Um, you can do a contact me through my website and obviously that will come through in terms of an email if anybody's got any questions and I'm happy to take them through yourself or obviously um, through any of those um, messaging systems. Amazing. What I'll do as well is I'll put all of the links in the episode description so that people can easily access uh, ways to communicate with you. Mm -hmm. um, it's been amazing. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Um, no, thank you. I've really enjoyed it. I've really learned so much, but I've also had a really good time. And I think I really do think our listeners are really going to benefit from this. So thank you for sharing your expertise with us. No problem at all. Thank you. Well, there you have it. That is the end of our episode all about transition with the wonderful Sue Asquith. Um, I hope you enjoyed listening to it as much as I enjoyed talking to her. It was really great to get someone's perspective who had come from being a parent, a childminder, an educator and also a assessor as well. So she had lots to share. I hope it resonated with you. Get in touch. Let us know what you think and share this podcast episode with your friends. Share it on Facebook, Instagram. We're on the usual podcast sites. And we look forward to seeing you next time. So that's it from today's episode. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you really enjoyed it. If you would like to get involved or would like to know more, come and find us on our social media sites. We have a Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Pinterest and TikTok account. All of the details will be in the description. And whatever you're doing, I hope you have a great day today.